case of Ronnie O'Neill, the shocking and cold-hearted conduct had a definite ulterior motive. I am not sorry for something I didn't do, and I am not sorry for the things I did do. O'Neill is on trial for the murders of his girlfriend and daughter, and for the attempted murder of his son. Police say that he beat 33-year-old Kenyatta Barron to death before killing their 9-year-old disabled daughter with a hatchet. He also stabbed his 8-year-old son before attempting to set their Riverview home alight. In a tragic twist, it later emerged that he had only been staying at the house because family and friends wouldn't take him in after he was shot in a drive-by shooting, and after initially refusing to let him stay, Kenyatta eventually relented. Surprisingly, O'Neill decides to represent himself in court, and it's clear from the outset of the trial that he has no remorse for what he's done. I did kill Kenyatta Ben. If you think I'm here to play around with y'all, goddammit, I'm not! O'Neill screams at the jury throughout the trial, claiming that he was set up by police, and even going so far as to allege that officers fabricated recordings of the 911 call. Because he's playing a fraudulent damn recording of me beating Kenyatta Barron 15 damn times when that did not happen. However, the most appalling display of ruthless cruelty comes from O'Neill when he interrogates his son, who he is alleged to have stabbed during the attack. How you doing? Good. It's good to see you, man. O'Neill tries to engage him in some reminiscing on the activities they used to do together in an attempt to manipulate both the boy and the court. Do you remember doing things with me? Going to family events and things like that? Objection relevant. Did I hurt you that night of this incident? Yes. I did. And how did I hurt you? O'Neill is eventually found guilty on all counts, but the jury opts against the death penalty. At sentencing, O'Neill maintains his remorseless facade, shaking his head and raising his eyebrows as the impassioned impact statements are read aloud. But his behavior goes from cold to downright cruel as he makes his own address to the court. Incredibly, O'Neill openly admits his lack of sorrow. I am not sorry for something I didn't do, and I am not sorry for the things I did do. Judge Michelle Sisko has this to say to O'Neill about his manipulative character. There's a part of you that can be very charming and very likable. And with all due deference to your counsel, they're all excellent lawyers, excellent lawyers. But I have to tell you, I think that your representation of yourself also aided in saving you from the death penalty. I really do. I really think that. She goes on to give an emotional evaluation of the case. This is the worst case I have ever seen. O'Neill is unremorseful and repeatedly interrupts Judge Sisko in an argumentative manner. That was a death scream. <clears throat> he continues to stand impassively, glancing around as she continues her highly charged address, even as she hands him a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. I'm going to mete out the punishment that I think this fact, this case deserves. On count one, Mr. O'Neill, I will adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to life in prison with a minimum mandatory of life in prison without the possibility of parole. O'Neill's crimes and subsequent conduct in court were shocking, but when it comes to Root, in the case of Camia Gamet, the judge grows so tired of her continued interruptions and insolence, that he makes a highly unusual threat. Gamet is appearing before Judge John McBain for sentencing after being found guilty of the murder of her disabled boyfriend, Marcel Hill. 31-year-old Gamet has a violent nature, and there was a history of domestic violence against Hill, who suffered from mental illness and cognitive impairment. In 2012, this abuse culminated in his murder when in a fit of rage, Gamet stabbed Hill 11 times in their Mississippi home, cutting his torso open with a knife. Gamet refuses to take accountability for the crime, claiming that she was attacked with a lamp in the dark by an unknown assailant and responded in self-defense. She alleges that it was only when she turned the light on after stabbing her attacker that she realized that it was, in fact, her boyfriend, Hill. I also remember the cries of help that he screamed as you plunged that knife in and out of his body. Her hearing today begins with Hill's aunt giving an impact statement to the court about the ongoing trauma that his death has caused. However, Gamma takes issue with the content of the statement and can be seen rolling her eyes and snickering throughout. Growing more incensed by her lack of respect and repeated interruptions, Judge McBain finally snaps and issues a threat to Gamut. Then you're going to shut your mouth or I'm going to have some duct tape put on it. Unfortunately, no duct tape can be found, and when it comes to Gamut's turn to address the court, her lack of insight is astounding, and you won't believe how the judge responds. We'll, we'll wait here for a moment so we can get her quiet. Basically, at trial, the way I was portrayed, everything, mostly everything was lies. There was a little bit of truth, but mostly I was convicted off of lies. Thankfully, Judge McBain isn't having any of it, and he explodes, reproaching Gamut for the callous and calculated nature of the murder. You were relentless. You stabbed, you stabbed, you stabbed, you stabbed, you stabbed until he was dead. I agree with the family. I hope you die in prison as well. You know, if this was a death penalty state, you'd be getting the chair. Gamut is ultimately sentenced to life in prison, and she continues to sneer and roll her eyes as she is led from the court to face her punishment. She later appeals the sentence, claiming that the judge failed to remain impartial. She is denied, 
and her conviction for first-degree murder stands. Gamut's hostile attitude and lack of accountability are hard to fathom, and in the case of Donta Wright, we see a similar affair, with the killer using the impact statement process to show the highest form of disrespect for his victim's family. Wright is in court for sentencing for the murder of 18-year-old Jordan Klee. Klee, who was a promising athlete, was shot dead during a robbery at Pine Lake Village Apartments in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Earlier, Wright had accepted a plea deal admitting to armed robbery, conspiracy to commit armed robbery, felony firearm, and second-degree murder. How do you want to plead to counts 2, 3, 6, and 7? I'll plead guilty. What did you do with that gun in Mr. Jordan Klee? Shot him. And where did you shoot him? The top. Was he and did, did you kill him with that shot? Yes. As part of the deal, additional robbery charges and charges related to another murder were dropped, saving Wright the risk of a lengthier sentence that he may have gotten had he gone to trial. Throughout his court appearances, Wright's demeanor has been carefree to say the least, and he has stood extremely relaxed and almost cheerful at times, even as the lengthy term attached to his plea deal was announced. The defendant will serve 23 to 50 years in the Michigan Department of Corrections. Those three counts will run concurrent to each other. However, at the sentencing hearing today, he takes his callousness to a new level. This year was supposed to be a year of celebration, of senior pictures with prom and graduation and parties. Instead, it was a nightmare, a nightmare that no parent should ever endure. Jordan's sister begins to address the court as his mother weeps openly behind her. However, instead of being remorseful, Wright shows an unbelievable lack of respect by smiling through the statement. If you think that's bad, just watch what happens next when the judge gives Wright the opportunity to speak. I just want to tell y'all, I'll be home soon, RP Keon, I love my family. In an incredibly tone-deaf declaration, Wright speaks to the court as if he's accepting an award, smiling as he tells them he'll be home soon. Here it is again in case you missed it. I just want to tell y'all, I'll be home soon, RP Keon, I love my family. Wright's comments are about to land him in hot water, though, as Judge David Swartz is incensed by the defendant's shocking lack of respect and remorse, and he halts the proceedings to ask the prosecution to cancel the plea deal and take the case to trial. Watching you sit there, smile, laugh, and shake your head like this was no big deal, I'm very tempted to just say, I'm not going to accept this sentence agreement, we'll go to trial, and if you're convicted of felony murder, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life, that means you'll die there. However. After an hour of consultation with the Klee family, the prosecution decides to go ahead with the deal, meaning he will spend 23 to 50 years in prison for his crimes. Donta Wright isn't the only killer to draw the wrath of the judge with a total disregard for common decency and humanity. The first degree kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder of his estranged wife, Therese Ann Lynch, who had a protective order in place against him at the time of her death. Moore was also found guilty of attempted murder for shooting a police officer. The incident unfolded when Moore forced Lynch into a rented car in a shopping mall car lot and drove her to their apartment before assaulting and shooting her. He has 20 shells. He wants no one to come to the door. He also shot Officer Todd Rowland, who was responding to the incident. Okay, 303 Adams been hit. Officer down. A hostage standoff ensued, and it was a number of hours before law enforcement managed to enter the apartment and arrest Moore. The killer sat impassively throughout his two-week trial, showing little emotion, even as the verdict was read out. Today's sentencing hearing starts in the same vein, with Moore sitting emotionless as Therese Ann's broken-hearted mother reads out her impact statement. What you did to my daughter, Therese Ann Marie Lynch, was evil, hateful, and despicable. You are now dead and rotting and repulsive to me. However, something in her scathing criticism hits a nerve with Moore, and what happens next defies the boundaries of common decency. Moore looks irritated as he slaps a bundle of papers down on the table, before calmly telling Therese Ann's mother that her daughter hated her. Read the journal she wrote, she hated you. <laughs> You're a loser. Despite being shushed and ordered to quiet and down by courtroom officials, Moore continues his heartless tirade to Theresa Ann's grieving mother. I have not one ounce of remorse for Theresa Ann's death. His parting words are particularly cruel, and even Judge Joel Novak is visibly shocked. If anybody didn't know what a piece of work you were before you start talking, they know it or not. I've never, ever seen anybody like you. The judge doesn't hold back as he begins his sentencing remarks to Moore, who is unrepentant of his outburst. I hope, really, I never ever see anybody like you again. The court doesn't allow me to punish you any more than I'm doing now. If, if I could, I would. The killer even goes as far as to shake his head in response to some of Judge Novak's comments. Yeah, shake your head, yeah, because you know you do. And I just can't believe what I've heard. But the judge continues on unfazed. Moore is eventually sentenced to three life sentences for his crimes against Therese Ann, along with an additional 25-year sentence for shooting Officer Todd Rowland. Impact statements are designed to offer victims and their loved ones an opportunity to address the perpetrator of the crime, giving them some form of closure. However, for Moore, it's just another chance to twist the knife on Therese Ann's family that it is truly baffling. One such person is Luis Bracamontes. I will break up soon and I will kill more. An illegal immigrant from Mexico is accused of killing two Sacramento police officers. The killings happened following a day-long crime spree that began in a motel parking lot 
where Bracamontes shot and killed Sheriff's Deputy Danny Oliver. He then took police on an extended chase through multiple counties with his girlfriend in tow, repeatedly carjacking a series of vehicles. The chase ended in Auburn, but not before Bracamontes engaged police in a shootout, killing Placer County Deputy Michael Davis Jr. Bracamontes' contempt for authority is evident from his shocking crimes, but he continues to stun onlookers with his behavior in the courtroom, laughing and giggling throughout his trial as the prosecutors detail the horrific double murder he committed. But now in this tiny street on Auburn, we have an AR-15 and another big heavy military gun firing at each other. Bullets are going everywhere. This is a haywire scene and Mike's not moving. And he flips them over and it's nothing but blood. Due to Bracamontes' repeated outbursts, Judge Steve White has to clear the court a number of times. And the defendant shows the true depths of his cold-blooded nature as he makes this chilling threat. I will break out soon and I will kill more. His behavior up to now has been heartless to the point of inhuman. And it's about to get a whole lot worse as the verdict is read out. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is that your true and correct verdict? So say you all. Yes. So say they all. Watch as Bracamontes listens nonchalantly as he's found guilty, laughing and untroubled as he drinks water and rocks in his chair. He looks toward the jury foreperson, giggling and mouthing something incomprehensible as she continues to read the verdict. He then looks toward his defense attorney, still smiling, leaning back in his chair like a man without a care in the world. It seems like Bracamontes can't contain his glee as the jury concludes the reading of the verdict and exits the courtroom. Thank you all. I want you to uh, step out now before anybody else leaves the courtroom. All the jurors. After such a display of blithe insensitivity, it's unsurprising that Bracamontes' heedless attitude continues into his sentencing hearing. As he is handed a death sentence, Bracamontes looks directly at the mother of his victim, Officer Danny Oliver, and claps. As the proceedings come to an end, he shakes the hand of his defense team like a man doing nothing more important than ending a business meeting, and he is led away to death row, still smiling. Bracamontes' baffling antics caused a huge stir in court as jurors and spectators struggled to understand his behavior.